So welcome to the Secure Dynamics uh, TechCast with me. I have a past guest, Elizabeth Rogers, who is partner in privacy and data security at uh, Michael Best and Friedrich. And I have uh, Joseph Dickinson, who thanks to Elizabeth, who made an uh, intro to, who's also a partner at uh, the same firm. Welcome, uh, Elizabeth, and welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Thank you. So we're going to talk about a subject that uh, I think everybody deals with one way or another, which is, uh, are you opting in, are you opting out? And we do this all day long with our apps and websites. So let's uh, start with something that has been taken center stage right now, given the um, given the poll position that Apple has today. Uh, and with their iOS 14, I believe they are coming out with a, a much, uh, much publicized privacy practices, which is putting, uh, Apple let loggerheads with Facebook and we've all seen that uh, being played out in public. But, but really the, the question that came to mind again as an as a avid Apple fan myself is really uh, per Google, there are an average 35 apps that an average smartphone user has. And you have an iOS 14 upgrade, I have 35 apps. And I was just thinking to myself, despite being a privacy geek, I'm going to be overwhelmed by these Am I opting in? Am I opting out? Right with these apps coming in. So even the best of intent, it is going to be chaos out there, right? So what do people do? I'm going to default to my usual, right? And the usual could be I'm going to opt in everything. I'm going to opt out of everything, and then deal with the consequences. So again, uh, just let's start with you, right? I mean, what are you seeing again in terms of uh, even with the company with the where the intention is right, the actual consumer experience and what results has. Uh, as a fallout of that, where do you think this is going? Well, I hope it's going towards more clarity, right? Because I think your point is an excellent one. There's been a lot of confusion, opt in, opt out. What are companies doing with my data? What are they telling me that they're doing with my data? Companies, quite frankly, small businesses, website hosts are confused because they have all these competing legal regimes and regulations. And depending on if, if their functionality is determined to be opt in or opt out. They have certain regulatory requirements that they have to meet. Sometimes they're interacting with people in a way that, that brings into play multiple regulations, some of which are opt in, some of which are opt out. And so what, what's the tough choice that they have to make? And I think often the website owner has to make the tough choice about which route minimizes my potential legal liability as opposed to which route creates the functionality that makes for the, the most pleasant user experience. And I don't think that's where anybody intended us to be, but I think that's exactly where, where, where we've gotten to. And that is the minimization of liability takes a precedent over the user experience. I think to your point, Edwin, with, with the new uh, Apple requirements, they're trying to move the ship in the right direction, right? So, if you think about the typical opt-in, the user has to say proactively, I'm opting in for certain uses of my information. And I think behind the scenes, the important goal is to eliminate those secondary and collateral uses that people don't know about. So if you go with an opt-in, which is what I, Apple is doing, you force the website owners to, to explicitly inform people about what they're doing with their data. Whereas in, in the opt-out world, if they have an opted out, then they've just sort of jumped in with both feet, often unknowingly into whatever processes or whatever uses the website terms of use and the privacy policy say that they're gonna use with the data. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I still think there's probably a lot of confusion to still be worked out because of the conflict between the legal requirements and quite frankly, the, the functionality, especially if you think about all the, the various uh, cookies that come into play, functional cookies, tracking cookies, and then you think about GDPR, right? It, it's a mess. And so I think that we're moving toward clarity, but we, we certainly have a long road to, to, to go. Elizabeth, your thoughts? I um, echo everything Joe says, and I think that it's um, a good debate for the tech giant leaders to be having vocally for a number of reasons, because as Joe said, you know, all the marbles are going in the same direction. 
Um, and that is to try to ethically give the consumer control of their data. And one thing uh, that we're realizing as a consequence of them somewhat losing control is that um, the consumer is fighting back. They're becoming more educated. Um, they're going to their lawmakers. And the more that tech giant leaders can solve this conundrum among themselves, the, le the more there will be a, a movement towards self-regulation as opposed to lawmakers stepping in and deciding what, you know, and how much control that we need to have. Um, so the public debate going on is excellent. It, it, all of the, the lawmakers are frustrated with a lack of movement on which direction to go in um, from Congress and from you know, the federal government. So state lawmakers are stepping in and saying, hold up Facebook, um, you aren't transparent. You're not telling uh, Elizabeth Rogers how you're gonna use her data after she plays a celebrity quiz. Um, so um, it, being more transparent, um, giving people like us the opportunity to, to decide whether we want our information to be used for research or advertising purposes is the right direction. And we just hope, um, as Joe pointed out, you know, that we get more clarity so that there's not 48 more states that enact consumer data privacy laws. So, so sticking to that point again, just just talking about the com complexity of, of compliance in one state and non-compliance in another state. Um, I know LinkedIn had adopted this. I think it was uh, when GDPR first came out in 2018, or right after that. Uh, was they treated everybody as an EU citizen? So I have GDPR rights with LinkedIn. I've exercised that three or four times over the last four years. Where I've asked for a copy of my data, I usually get it. Uh, in two chunks, one within the first half hour, the second within the next 24 hours in CSV form that is actually understandable. And it gives me that dump, which makes me want to kind of take pause because I'm very active on LinkedIn, but just seeing it all together just is, is a wake up call for me. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, is there a high road where you, you I mean, uh, Joe, you mentioned about the uh, legal ramifications of, of opt-in versus opt-out. Uh, is there something a business says, let, let's put the legal aside for a minute. What is the right thing to do by the consumer? And if they take that high road, is there a, a, a better outcome, not just for the consumer uh, of that company, but also it actually reduces the burden because now you are taking the strictest path forward. Right. Or is that is that an illusion of mine? I don't want to say it's an illusion. I, I, I think it's certainly aspirational, um, but I think it's an excellent point because from the consumer's perspective, right, the, a lot of the motivation behind some of the, in, the enhanced privacy laws that we see uh, is, is one key factor. And that is people would, would like to know what websites are doing with their information. And so when you have this boilerplate language that are part that makes up your privacy policy or your website terms of use, and it's typical legalese and it's confusing and it's all encompassing, that doesn't help users understand what's really happening with their information. And so if, if businesses take, to your point, actually the, the high road, and they're willing to, to spell out in clear, concise language for all users, Here's what we want to do, and here's what we intend to do with your information. I think users feel a lot better, at least if they know what's happening. Even if they don't agree with some of the things that you're trying to do, the fact that they understand and you've been up front, and to Elizabeth, uh, to her earlier point, you've been transparent about what you're going to do with that information. If we were in a world, and, and again, it's not necessarily illusional, delusional, it's aspirational, where business owners are in a position that they're, they're able to, to have a meaningful communication via website terms of use, privacy policy, so that the typical average user can read that information and understand what you're gonna do with my, my data, especially my personal data. I think that that goes a long way in helping people feel better about what's happening as opposed to being uh, uh, in, in the, where we are today where people feel threatened and they want lawmakers to take control of this and they want lawmakers to penalize business owners 
but you know, the vast majority of business owners aren't trying to do the wrong thing. Yeah. They're just confused about what the right thing is. And so if we enable both sides of the equation, the business owners, the website owners, to clearly understand what they need to tell users about what, what's happening with their information. And if the users, you know, are able to understand what's happening with my, I think that puts everybody on more of a level playing field and there isn't this confrontational nature and there, there isn't this sense that there's the, you know, the don't pay any attention to the man behind the, the green, um, what, what, what the, it's from the Wizard of Oz, uh, the, the, the green curtain. Yeah. Um, I think people feel better about that. I think businesses can feel better about that. And I think that, that they're communicating, right? If we can, can facilitate that communication so that everybody's trying to get to the same place, that goes a long way in taking this off the, 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 the regulator's plate and having to be uh, uh, you know, using penalties to enforce that or to encourage that conduct. Got it. So I have a question for you. So just uh, piggybacking on to what Joe just said is, who do you think from a stakeholder perspective in an organization, and you deal with a lot of clients, right, which is uh, in order to kind of do the right thing and be able to uh, take a customer centric view, uh, it probably doesn't come from the legal department, but does it then come from marketing? Does it come from the CEO himself or herself? Does it come from the CISO? Where do you see, like who, who, who ends up playing that, that consumer first role? I, well, first I believe that the philosophy should be that it comes from the top down, but in practical, you know, like Tim Cook um, making statements on behalf of their philosophy. Um, but in real life and practical experience, what I've found is that it's a combination of the marketing team and the in-house legal team working together. Um, there's a very strong need for training of the marketing department. They don't need to be lawyers, but they need to be aware of various um, practices that number one, risk the company getting exposed for collecting data without the proper consents, for example, and text, text marketing, email marketing. Um, so I would, I would say at this point in the evolution of the information age, it's no longer, you know, like people used to say um, that information security and privacy is an IT thing. It's an organizational risk objective, I think. And I wanted to add on to what Joe said, you know, about the clarity um, in privacy policies. We used to joke before the CCPA and the GDPR that we should tell our clients, your privacy policy should state, we're gonna collect everything about you that's out there in the universe and publish it to everybody, a one sentence long transparent privacy policy, but now consumers are becoming more aware and frightened of tracking technologies. Um, so they do want to know the categories of data that's being collected about them and who those categories of data are being shared with. So I fully believe that if that culture is a part of an organization from the top down, that it, it can be possible for the consumer's desire for privacy and the organization's desire to target advertising to coexist. Got it. Uh, so, so great conversation again. Uh, thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Thanks for your time, uh, Joe, and looking forward to keeping in touch. Absolutely, yeah, thank, thank you. Look forward to continuing the dialogue. <laughs> thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.